in the presidential election of 1916, incumbent Woodrow Wilson won, in part, due to the popularity of the unofficial campaign slogan, He Kept Us Out of War. That war, of course, was World War I. And yet five months later, in April 1917, Woodrow Wilson asked Congress to declare war on Germany. Needless to say, a lot had transpired over those five months. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more... Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, a podcast about history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 24. This week, we explore the U.S. and World War I. We are coming to you this week from the Zimmerman Telegram Studios, located on the campus of Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts. Keeping us on track and on task is our executive producer, Lulu Spencer, and our new associate producer, Devin McHugh. If you want to find out more about me, this podcast, and our guests, head over to our website, inthepastlane.com, and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Well, people, the calendar says it's spring, but we still have snow on the ground here in central Massachusetts, courtesy of an April Fool's Day snowstorm. But today, 40 miles east of here, it's opening day at venerable Fenway Park in Boston. And a quick check of the syllabi for my history courses here at the college tells me there's just a few weeks left in the semester. So, spring weather is probably just around the corner. As for me, I'm about to hit the road for two speaking gigs. First, I'll give a talk on the Gilded Age at the historic Salisbury House in Des Moines, Iowa. From there, I head to Sacramento, California to give a one-day university talk on five turning points that changed American history. If you don't know about One Day University, I highly recommend you check it out. They now hold events in 55 cities across the United States and feature some really cool talks on history, science, philosophy, health, and more. As for my trip, I've never been to Des Moines or Sacramento before. So I'm really looking forward to checking out their historic sites and maybe some craft beer. But before that, we need to do this episode of In the Past Lane. This week, it's all about World War I. And the timing is perfect, since this week marks the 100th anniversary of the United States declaration of war against Germany and the Central Powers on April 6, 1917. Our episode has two parts. First, I'll do a setup piece that explores why the U.S. adopted a policy of neutrality when World War I broke out, and how... Once the U.S. entered the conflict, pro-war sentiment exploded. Second, I sit down with historian Michael Nyberg to talk about his new book, The Path to War, How the First World War Created Modern America. It's a close examination of the years between 1914, when World War I began in Europe, and 1917, when the U.S. finally chose to enter the conflict. It's a fascinating and largely forgotten period in American history. Okay, people, make sure you have your gas mask. Your journey in the past lane begins now. Today we focus our attention on World War I, the greatest military conflict in history to that point. Let's begin with a tale of two songs. When World War I broke out in Europe in the summer of 1914, the vast majority of Americans believed the U.S. should remain neutral. Now, why is this? Why sit on the sidelines of the Great War? Well, for most of U.S. history, American political culture contained a strong isolationist mindset that argued the U.S. just had to stay out of European affairs, especially European wars. And this policy goes way back to the founding of the Republic. It was most vividly expressed by George Washington in his farewell address in 1796. In this address, Washington warned his fellow founders of many things that threatened the survival of the young nation, including the dangers of getting ensnarled in European diplomatic intrigue. Here's what he said on the matter. 
Against the insidious wiles of foreign influence, the attention of a free people ought to be constantly awake, since history and experience prove that foreign influence is one of the most baneful foes of Republican government. In other words, cozying up to foreign governments by signing treaties, entering alliances, or joining wars was a recipe for disaster. And for the most part, over the next 120 years, the United States stayed true to this isolationist principle. But over that time period, the U.S. also grew into a world power, at least economically. Indeed, by 1900, the U.S. was the number one industrial economy in the world. And with that power came both confidence and temptation. Some Americans argued that the U.S., now that it was rich and powerful, needed to engage more in world affairs. They argued that the U.S. needed to commit itself to defending its interests and promoting democracy and human rights around the world. And we can see an early debate about this issue unfold in the 1890s over the issue of brutal Spanish rule in Cuba. That controversy ultimately led to the Spanish-American War in 1898. Now, stay tuned on that front, since we have an upcoming episode of In the Past Lane devoted to that so-called Splendid Little War. But the Great War that broke out in 1914 was different. For one thing, it was happening in Europe, much further away than Cuba. And for another, World War I was a massive conflict that quickly began to lay waste to nations and kill millions of people. So when World War I broke out, President Woodrow Wilson announced that the U.S. would remain neutral, and the American people supported this decision. The accounts of the war's horrors in the daily newspapers convinced them that this was not a fight worth entering. Popular culture in America reflected this desire to remain neutral. In 1915, the most popular song in America was I Didn't Raise My Boy to Be a Soldier. This is how it starts out. Ten million soldiers to the war have gone, who may never return again. Ten million mothers' hearts must break, for the ones who died in vain. Head bowed down in sorrow, in her lonely years, I heard a mother murmur through her tears. And then it kicks to the chorus. I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. I brought him up to be my pride and joy. To place a musket on his shoulder To shoot the mother, mother's darling boy But then, just two years later, the number one song in the United States was Over There, a rousing patriotic ditty by the famed songwriter George M. Cohan that extolled America's commitment to helping the Allied powers in the war. Here's how that one begins. Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Take it on the run, on the run, on the run. Hear them calling you and me, every son of liberty. Hurry right away, no delay, go today. And then its famous chorus. Over there, over there, send the word, send the word over there. That the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, the drums rum coming everywhere. So prepare, say a prayer. Clearly, something had changed between 1915 and 1917. American popular opinion had moved from isolationism and neutrality to militarism and engagement. How this transformation occurred is the focus of a new book, The Path to War, How the First World War Created Modern America. In just a minute, I'll speak with its author, historian Michael Nyberg. Don't go anywhere, people. We'll be right back. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. If you are enjoying this podcast, then please subscribe to In the Past Lane at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you access your podcasts. Subscribing is free, and once you do it, new episodes of In the Past Lane are automatically downloaded to your listening device. Subscribing also gives you access to the entire back catalog of In the Past Lane episodes. And if you do subscribe, please leave a review. Thanks. Welcome back to In the Past Lane. 
I'm your host, Edward T. O'Donnell, and with me now is historian Michael Nyberg. Michael is professor of history at the U.S. Army War College. He is the author of many books on military history, including Fighting the Great War, A Global History, and The Blood of Free Men, The Liberation of Paris, 1944. His most recent book, out now from Oxford University Press, is The Path to War, How the First World War Created Modern America. And that's the book we'll talk about today. Michael Nyberg, welcome to In the Pass Lane. Hello, thanks for having me. I'd like to begin by asking you to explain the basic goal of this book, which it seems to me is to challenge a longstanding view about World War I, particularly about the attitude of U.S. citizens. I think most people think of and, and have been told that Americans were resolutely against the war, against entry into the war right up till April 1917 when Woodrow Wilson essentially, against popular opinion, led us into war, and he basically or ignored public opinion to send the nation to war, and then eventually Americans got on board with it. But your book tells a very different story. It really takes that close look at the three-year period between August 1914 and April 1917, where American attitudes towards the war really evolved and got us into it. You know, essentially, on the eve of war, American attitudes are quite different from what they were back in August of 1914. So maybe you could begin by telling our listeners you know, what your approach was and what you found when you got into the archives. Sure. I was really trying to do, I think, two things with the book. One, I was trying to fill in a kind of gap in my own understanding. I never really learned very much at all about why the United States got involved in World War I, other than through the eyes of Woodrow Wilson. And I'm trained as a social historian, which makes me in instinctively think from the bottom up. So I kind of wanted to see what the American people were thinking and doing and how that might have pushed Washington rather than the other way around. And I had done a book on this process in Europe in 1914 and found some really quite shocking things that the political leadership in Europe is, in fact, not terribly representative of what the people were doing. So one thing I was trying to do, I think, was fill in a space in my own head, uh, fill in an understanding. And the other was to take that social history methodology that I had been trained in and apply it to a question that maybe isn't quite often thought of in social history terms, that is, why states enter wars. But if you take it away from the presidential level and bring it down to the level of the people, as you noted, a very different picture emerges. And in my view, that picture is not only more complex, not only more compelling, but it helps to explain why the United States behaved the way that it did both during the war and after the war. So it's also a kind of more convincing explanation. And I think in general, what historians who were trained as I was in social history tend to think is that by focusing on the political elites, you often miss the larger picture that's going on in the society. So that's what I was really trying to do. And to the maximum extent that I could, I was trying to make this a story about more than just the major urban centers that have been pretty well studied. And more than just simply the, the key leaders, like you say, like President Woodrow Wilson. Correct. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting approach and really reflects, I think, some big changes in military history, because for a long time, military history was sort of quintessentially the story of leaders and generals and flanking maneuvers. And it's been a lot of change with taking a more social history approach, both to who are these soldiers on the ground and how do their lives and their attitudes shape the war, but also about the people on the home front, which is the focus, I guess it's the pre-home front in this period. Yeah, that's one of those questions, too. I mean, I, you know, you think of the American people. We are constantly debating and arguing about political topics in this country. And the notion that we weren't doing that 100 years ago from 1914 to 1917 just struck me as nonsensical, that there was this sort of consensus opinion that didn't change from 1914 to 1917 just struck me as not plausible. And of course, when you dig into it a little bit, you find that just as we are now, 100 years ago, Americans were arguing, debating, disagreeing about the most important issue of the day, which was the war in Europe. Indeed. Well, at the risk of moving away from the very thing I just mentioned, which, and you, which you mentioned, which is the social history angle, it might be good actually to start with President Wilson to a degree and circle back to 1914 when the war breaks out and Americans are, are watching from across the Atlantic. What is President Wilson's attitude? He announces U.S. will remain neutral and why does he do this? And also, what does he, as he thinks strategically and politically about the war and our neutrality? What's his goal in taking that position? Well, one thing that he's trying to figure out is how long this war might possibly go. If it looks like it's going to be a short war, then it's in America's interest to sort of moderate its response. So at first, neutrality is a way to moderate that response. It's also a way to prevent what's going on in Europe from hitting the United States, because, of course, there are 
citizens of the and descendants of citizens of the German Empire, Austro-Hungarian, Russian, Irish here in the United States. And there is a concern that if this gets out of hand, it could cause violence in the United States. Wilson's definition of neutrality is an interesting topic in and of itself. You can define neutrality a lot of different ways. Yes. You could define neutrality as the United States doesn't impact the war at all. That is a sort of trade embargo. You could define it as equal trade with both sides, or you could define it as the American people get to trade with whomever they want. And it is, of course, this third definition that Wilson uses. So it looks like neutrality to Wilson. It certainly does not look like neutrality to Germany. And there are some French leaders who, by 1915, are referring to the United States as our great neutral ally. So it doesn't necessarily look like neutrality to the French either. Right. So Wilson's trying to keep American options open. He's also trying to make sure that the war in Europe doesn't create an economic crisis here in the United States. The war caused the closing of the New York Stock Exchange and and Philadelphia and Chicago for about four months while the United States figured out what the economic impact was going to be. So there's that risk as well. And that's pretty hard to believe these days that it would be closed for such a lengthy period of time. And it also brings up that, like you say, the economic angle. Ultimately, what happens in those first years of the war is the United States benefits immensely financially from the war and seems pretty pleased with that position so long as they can remain neutral. There's that issue. And there's also the fact, as I kind of show in the book, I do show in the book, that America's pocketbook and its kind of soul are going in the same direction, by which I mean the vast majority of Americans think the British and French are on the correct side. Now, they may not necessarily want the United States to jump in on that side with them, but they believe the French and British are right. So if that's where your soul is and that's where your head is, and that's also where the American economy is going, then there's no contradiction between those two things. Right. We have stuff, they need stuff, and it's a nice benefit that we'll actually we'll make some money from it. But it's sort of, like I said, it's multifaceted. Correct. So part of that thinking is influenced about how Americans are perceiving the war. They have a long time to sort of observe what's happening there. So they are paying attention in 1914, 1915, on up to the, the eve of our entry into the war. but. First of all, how are they getting their information? There are multiple sources. There are European sources, but also American journalists. And how are they interpreting the kind of news that they're getting out of Europe? And how does that shape their attitudes? And how does, how does it help their attitudes evolve over the course of the pre-war period? Absolutely. So one thing that I certainly was taught uh, that was that the Americans are getting this biased propaganda news from Great Britain. And that stuff is certainly out there. But what's interesting is the American reporters that go to the Western Front in 1914 including some of the most famous journalists in the United States at the time, all write articles in which they tell their readers, look, the British have a slant. They're trying to slant the news. Don't believe the crazy excesses that we know they're trying to peddle. Believe what we Americans have seen with our own eyes, because that's bad enough. So yes, the the, the British propaganda is out there, but that doesn't mean we can make the next leap, which is to say that every American was reading it and believing it as if it were the truth, as if it were the absolute truth, because American reporters who are there are qualifying an awful lot of this, while at the same time, they're reporting on things like the burning of the Belgian town of Louvain, which many witnessed with their own eyes. And so American reporters can say, look, what's out there is bad enough. What's out there is is terrible enough. And then there are American writers, Edith Wharton is one, who were living in Europe when the war began, and they begin writing books, and they begin writing articles for newspapers in which they're saying, you know, these are public figures in whom Americans have great confidence, saying, look, this is what's happening here. The Germans invaded France. They invaded Belgium. They're doing all of these terrible things. They're taking prisoners of war. They're destroying communities. They're forcing labor. They're, you know, all of the things that the German army did, in fact, do. Trusted, reliable Americans are reporting that back to the United States. Trusted, I think, is the key word, because they are seen as neutral and trustworthy as opposed to the European sources, particularly British, that seem to have a very clear vested interest in ginning up American anti-German sentiment. Absolutely. And many of these reporters are aware of that and tell their readers that, that the British are trying to draw us in. And if we do get into the war, they say, it needs to be for American interests rather than for British interests, which is, of course, exactly what happens. Indeed. Well, some Americans are so influenced by these reports that, I mean, most Americans are content to remain neutral, but there's a sizable number of Americans who are not. And they decide to somehow find their way into the French or British army, uh, many of them going to Canada to do that. 
Can you tell us a little bit more about that? That's a fascinating sort of story that sometimes shows up in films and and in literature, but it's not a well-known story of how many Americans got into the war well before the their own country did. It's a fascinating story. I, I uh, have a friend of mine in Canada who estimates that it could be as many as 80,000 Americans who left the United States and wow. went into Canada and joined the British Army in Canada. And it's very difficult to verify those numbers, but his estimate is as many as 80,000. Then there are other Americans who went to Britain and France, quite in defiance of American neutrality. They could have lost their citizenship for doing it, and joined either the British or French army. They include, of course, people like Joyce Kilmer, who's killed later on in the war. Yep. They include Alan Seeger. They include the son of the single largest corporation in the United States, the Pennsylvania Railroad, a guy by the name of Billy Thaw, who was from Pittsburgh and knew how to fly airplanes, and went to France and created an all-American fighter squadron. These are people who believe deeply that democracy was threatened in Europe and that the United States if it just sat back and collected money off of this war without making a contribution some other way, was selling its soul, was profiting from this kind of catastrophe and slaughter. So it's an enormous number. If, if the Canadian number is right, it could be you know that 80,000 plus easily another 20 or 25,000 from other sources. The number could be in the into the six figures. And the number of Americans who serve in the Central Powers Army, that is Austria, Hungary, Germany, and the Ottoman Empire, is infinitesimally small. Right. Most of them are already citizens of those empires returning home. So that's a remarkable statement about where America's beliefs were. That doesn't include the number of nurses, the number of doctors, the number of Americans who just gave their money, who gave their books, who gave their clothes. It's a remarkable contribution. Ninety-eight percent of it goes to the Allies. Yeah. As a historian, you can see those are the seeds of, of growing if not pro-war sentiment, pro-ally sentiment, and ultimately support for or acceptance of the fact that the United States needs to enter the war. Absolutely. Theodore Roosevelt is probably the loudest voice simply because he's the most famous. He did the 1915-1916 equivalent of a blog, writing newspaper articles for the Kansas City Star that were then syndicated across the country. A number of other prominent Republicans initially supported Wilson in, in kind of facing a joint crisis together. But after the Lusitania, they increasingly break from Wilson and get more critical as well. So there's a lot of Americans saying, look, if we're just going to sit here and collect money off of this, we're selling our souls. We're doing something that is fundamentally wrong. And that's actually coming from the American evangelical Christian community as well, that this is not the way a society that holds itself up to the principles America holds itself to should behave. Yeah. And it's kind of, a, it's interesting in the long view to see how that's a departure from the 19th century position, which was will be a great example to the world and it's up to them to follow us. And now with, with great economic might by 1900, 1910, there's this growing belief that uh, with that power comes responsibility, that you in fact have to intervene in world affairs to make sure that both Christianity and republicanism and civilization, as they understand it, is protected and ultimately spread. And I think that's why Wilson is careful to say the United States doesn't want anything out of this war. We don't want pieces of territory, and we don't want to seek an indemnity from the Germans. We want to fight this war to do what is right. And the Europeans aren't sure what to make of this. And in fact, in the post-war period, they try to draw the United States in to taking part of the Ottoman Empire, taking part of Armenia, to make America own part of the post-war settlement. And Wilson's vision is entirely different from that. Well, you mentioned Theodore Roosevelt a moment ago, and I thought we could get back to him for a quick moment, because he leads, he not only leads through his writings, but quite vociferously leads what's called the preparedness movement. Well before the United States enters the war, he's saying, we are unprepared, we're going to get into this war, regardless of what Wilson says, and we need to be ready. We need to you know, build up our, our peacetime military. And I think one thing that's important, especially when I think about my students, they have no idea that the United States has ever had a period in its time where it didn't always have a big military waiting to, to go into war, where up until the middle of the 20th century, the tradition was to fight our wars and then dismantle our military until the next war. And so that's really what Roosevelt is getting at. We have a very, very small military, and he says we need to build it up. Right. And part of this whole process is to sort of embarrass Wilson into doing something at the federal level. So it's not just Roosevelt. I mean, this was one of the pieces of this research that captivated me so much. There is a Committee for American Medical Preparedness that Charles Mayo of the Mayo Clinic begins. Thomas Edison began a Committee of American Scientific Preparedness. Virtually every university archive that I went into talked about some sort of level of preparedness that they were going to do. 
And part of it is saying, what contribution can we make in the midst of a national emergency? But part of it also is saying to the federal government, look, you have to do something. What we can do is limited. We can train a couple of hundred guys in the wilderness in Plattsburgh, New York, but that's not the same as getting the country ready for a war that we may have to fight, or at any rate, to have enough military strength that the Europeans will leave us alone. So part of the preparedness movement is this private initiative, which I found fascinating, that is a response really to what we would today sort of call gridlock, that the Congress and right. the president can't agree on the way they want to go forward. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and what pro-preparedness people have very much on their side are some events that take place that really begin to move the needle as far as public opinion, including putting more pressure on the, the Wilson administration, events in 1915 and 1916 that you know push people more towards the idea that war is inevitable. And, and I'm thinking about incidents like the sabotage campaigns carried out by German operatives within the U.S., uh, some of them small incidents, but some of them like the Black Tom explosion, quite, quite spectacular. And then there's the Lusitania, the sinking of the Lusitania, and then something that very few people pay attention to, which but was really important in terms of preparedness, which is the conflict along the U.S.-Mexico border, the crisis at the border which creates a sense that we are increasingly vulnerable as the war goes on. Could you tell our, our listeners a little bit more about how these events, maybe some others, how they play into the, the, the widening acceptance of somehow we're going to get into this war? Sure. From 1914 to 1917, two things are really, two ideas, I guess, are really generating in the American psyche as a result of those events that you mentioned. One is the fear that we're being encircled, that Germany is active in Mexico, which of course they were, that they were seeking an alliance with Japan, or that they might seek as part of the price of getting Britain and France out of the war, they might seek pieces of Canada, they might seek parts of the Caribbean, they might want the French base at Martinique. Uh, this is a time period when the U.S. had just opened the Panama Canal. Now, all of a sudden, all of that looks like it's at risk. So in 1916, the U.S. bought the Danish Virgin Islands from Denmark in order to make sure the Germans didn't force them out of Danish hands. So one fear is that this policy of neutrality is going to encircle you and create a, a strategic situation in which the enemy states, in this, in this case Germany with an alliance with Mexico and Japan, will surround you because you can't defend yourself. This is the fear that the Zimmerman telegram confirms in the spring of 1917. The other fear that's in the American consciousness is that the U.S. will end up, the model they, many Americans use, the analogy they use, is that the United States will end up like China, a vast, wealthy very rich country that can't defend itself and ends up getting picked apart by the European imperialists. The sense is that when the war ends, the Europeans are going to be so bankrupt and so in need of money that they're going to look for places where they can take wealth. And the one country in the world that is simultaneously rich and simultaneously unable to defend its own interests, that's the United States. So preparedness isn't necessarily saying, let's get ready to go and fight Germany. Preparedness is saying, let's make ourselves strong enough so that the countries of the world treat us with a lot more respect. And the analogy that's sometimes used in editorial cartoons is the porcupine, an animal that isn't really all that threatening to any other animal, but nobody wants to attack it. Right. So preparedness can admit of many definitions and many flavors, but they all come from this sense that Wilson's policy of neutrality has made the U.S. less safe, not more. And that's kind of interesting, because people did bank on the idea that neutrality would make us safe because the best way to stay out of the war is to stay out of the war and to let the let the warring parties fight and so forth. And it's within a year or two that people begin to say, wait a minute, neutrality isn't, you know, isn't as simple a solution as it would have first appear, that it in fact does make us potentially more vulnerable. And the other is, I guess, a related notion, which is that people are coming to realize that this is really a modern war. You quote one of a newspaper editor in 1917 who says, you know, the idea that you can remain neutral in an era of steamships, railroads, telegraphs, and underwater cables linking the continents is, is just absurd. The, the world is linked in ways that were unthinkable in generations earlier, and that means it's really effectively impossible to stay out of the war. And all you have to do is look at a simple map, which any American could have done in any American newspaper of the war to see that. Australia's involved, New Zealand's involved, India's involved. There are naval battles off the South American coast. This is not a war like the American Civil War or even the Franco-Prussian War or the Russo-Japanese War, which are relatively contained in space. It just isn't happening in this war. This is also, of course, the time period when the Germans use Irish revolutionaries to try to hurt the British government. The British are using Arab revolutionaries to hurt the Ottoman Empire. So it's not, the, the Germans, of course, famously insert Lenin into Russia 
to collapse the Russian government from within. So it's not out of the realm of the possible that the Germans would try the same trick with Mexico or try it with Japan. So this is exactly what that newspaper editor and thousands, millions of Americans uh, were arguing, that we can't stick our heads in the sand. We have to be in a position to recognize what's happening and be in a position to defend ourselves. And of course, in 1914, as you noted, the United States military is just not in a position to do that. Well, another issue that I wanted to look at as part of this sort of, when we keep talking about the, the American people, of course, the American people then and now are, are divided into many, many subgroups. And two, a couple of groups that are really important in the pre-World War period are Irish Americans and German Americans. They're, they're two of the largest ethnic groups, and both of them have distinct links to the issues and the, the concerns about the fighting. And raise therefore, they raise suspicions about what, how loyal these two groups might be should the United States get into the war. Can you tell us a little bit more about those two groups and, and what the reality was, what the deeper reality was. Sure. I mean, people spoke then, they understood that there was no such thing as a German vote or even an Irish vote, that the German community in particular was divided between Protestants and Catholics. The more recent migration from Germany was disproportionately Catholic. That is, these were people who very often left Germany because they didn't like the direction that the Prussian government was taking the country. They were also the most assimilated by far, of the American community. So it's a complicated picture. I, I think it's defensible that when the war began in 1914, German and Irish communities were most likely to want the U.S. to remain neutral. But even their views change as the war goes on, so that by the spring of 1917, most German Americans are saying, virtually all of them are saying, look, if a war happens between us, the U.S., and Germany, you have to know that our mother country is here. And of course, these are people like Eddie Rickenbacker, Dwight Eisenhower, John Pershing is German-American, you know, people who have German ancestry, but clearly understand themselves to be American. The Irish case to me was even more fascinating. By 1916, there is this event that I kind of alluded to where the Germans help fuel a rebellion in Dublin that is an absolute and abject failure. What that leads American Irish, uh, Irish Americans to conclude is that the best hope for Ireland is now not a rebellion necessarily but for the United States and Britain to be on the same side, for that side, of course, to win, and then for Woodrow Wilson to be able to go to the British and say, okay, national self-determination means that you now need to take the Irish more seriously. You now need to give them some of the things that they want. Now, Irish Americans didn't know that Woodrow Wilson didn't consider the Irish a separate nation. He considered them, in effect, British. But the point is that by the time you get to 1917, the German and the Irish views on the war had come very close to the consensus American view, which was not the case in 1914. So again, understanding that dynamism and the way that this is changing over those years is really critical to this story. And the Irish one in particular, I, I agree that that's a very interesting detail that's really often lost in the telling of the story, which is that the Irish American community didn't want to see Germany win because they were so anti-British, which you sometimes hear people say. What they really thought is that if the U.S. is going to get involved, they, they would use that leverage to gain Irish independence. And that, of course, didn't happen. That, of course, didn't happen, right, which then led, of course, to the Anglo-Irish Civil War and all of the things that then come out of it. But what's important, I think, to understand is there was much greater divergence in 1914 than there is by the spring of 1917 for reasons that are both American, quote unquote, and internal to these ethnic groups themselves. Yeah, that seems very clear. So following the timeline here, as you say, towards 1917, where is President Wilson in all of this? It seems clear to me that one of your arguments in the book is that Wilson is actually following public opinion, being moved by this movement of American attitudes. And he's not simply leading the charge towards, ultimately charge towards war. He's very perceptive about how attitudes are shifting. And he's in some ways behind that shift in public opinion. Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about that? I think he is behind. Um, you know, he was an unpopular president. He only won in 1912 because there's a split in the Republican Party. The 1916 election was so close that Wilson went to sleep thinking that he had lost. So this notion that Wilson is somehow channeling the spirit of the American people certainly did not track with people at the time. Even people who voted for him very often said, look, I'm voting for the guy only because I don't want to change horses in midstream. But I don't have a lot of faith or a lot of confidence in him. So this notion of Wilson as this kind of messianic president, there is a group of Americans, there are people who see him in that light, but that's by no means the consensus that Americans are feeling. He's a hard guy to read. He's a hard guy to sort of understand what he's thinking and what he's doing. 
I think by the spring of 1917, he was hoping that he could pull another rabbit out of the hat. That is, he had managed to get the Lusitania sinking crisis resolved without war. There was a torpedoing of another ship called the Sussex. And I think he thought by 1917, he would be able to do that yet again. Then when Germany announced that it would resume unrestricted submarine warfare, we would call that today a red line. Yes. Wilson realized that he really was out of options. And then the Zimmerman telegram just infuriated the American people so much that even two of his own cabinet members said, if Wilson doesn't go to war now, we're going to resign our positions. We, we can't serve in a government that's going to allow this to continue. So right. I don't see Wilson leading the American people into war. I see him finally saying, look, I don't have any more options. Right. Could you tell us just briefly what about the Zimmerman telegram? I think everybody's heard of it, but it's always good to remind listeners and remind ourselves, like, what exactly was in that telegram and how did it play a role in, in clarifying the situation? It's a fascinating document that goes from the German foreign ministry in Berlin to Mexico via the United States, which was then a neutral country. The British intercepted it, handed it to the Americans, and the telegram says, we, Germany, are going to resume unrestricted submarine warfare. We think this will bring the United States into the war. If that happens, we want you, Mexico, to invade the southern United States and tie down the American army. If that works, we'll give you back everything that you had lost in the Mexican-American War. So that's Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, California, parts of Utah and Colorado. And oh, by the way, we'd like you to approach Japan and see if they'd like to join into this alliance as well. Mm -hmm. so when the American attaches first see this, they think maybe the British are trying to pull a trick. This is a way to get us into the war. So the British come up with a really clever way of giving the Americans the telegram without revealing that they've broken the German codes, which is that they release the version that went from Washington to Mexico City, not the version that went from Berlin to Washington. They had them both. Uh -huh. And the reason they did that is they assumed that if the Germans saw this, they would assume that the leak came on the Mexican end, thereby their own code-breaking effort would be safe. So there are still a lot of Americans who say, look, this is too stupid. Nobody, nobody, the Germans are too smart. There's no way they do anything idiotic like this. Zimmerman is asked at a press conference, basically, did you write this? And he said, yes, I did, because he figured out they've got me anyway. This way I can negotiate out in the open. And that telegram is what made Americans really, that's when the fury really begins to hit, both because of the affront to American honor and because the threat to the United States is now not just to the East Coast, where the German submarines were operating, but to the American South and West. And it seems to play into that part that you point out towards the end of the book, because you bring us right up to essentially April 6th, 1917, when the U.S. declares the war, that there's this palpable feeling in this, you know, the late winter, spring of 1917, that the United States has run out of options, that it's tried neutrality, it's tried all these, it's tried to defuse incidents like the Lusitania and so forth, but that by the spring of 1917, that the sense that war is inevitable seems to be seems to be spreading. And you cite that famous uh, article in the Saturday Evening Post by the journalist, is it Mary Reinhardt? Mary Roberts Reinhardt, yeah. Yeah. And uh, in which she says, by the time you read this, we may already be at war and goes on to say that this is understandable and that th this is going to be an important fight for all Americans to engage in. Right. So this is why I, I describe in the book and in other places, I, I don't sense an American enthusiasm for the First World War. I sense an American sense of determination. We have no other option. There's nothing left for us to do. But if we're going to fight this war, let's do it. And let's do it the right way. Let's do it with everything we've got. Let's get this over as quickly as we can. And then let's go back to the life that we wanted to lead. But by the spring of 1917, there simply are no other options. Neutrality is going to put you in an even more dangerous position. Yeah, it would be absurd to imagine that American attitudes remain the same leading up to you know, through three years of, of observing the war, of fending the war off, of having the war come to their doorstep in, in a couple of incidents. So it, that makes it makes a lot of sense. Now, what, what happens next, of course, is in April of 1917, the United States does declare war, enters the war, eventually gets into the war and uh, helps bring about an allied power victory and then comes home. And then, and then begins a really interesting chapter of the history of the war in that Americans begin to rapidly reinterpret the purpose of the war, the reasons for the war, the, the justice of the war, all of those things. And that in some ways plays directly into how we've remembered the war to the extent that we've remembered it at all. It's in some ways a forgotten war, but the parts that we remember tend to be shorthand descriptions of how Americans were essentially against the war. Could you tell us more about how that memory of the war shapes the history of the war? Sure. So I taught this one time by 
asking my students to think of it a little bit like an hourglass. That is, there's great diversions of view in 1914. By 1917, you're at that thin part of the hourglass where Americans agree on what it is they need to do. And November 11th, 1918, when the Germans lay down their weapons, that divergence begins again. So there's a question immediately from November 11th, 1918. If the Germans have stopped shooting, if the Germans have stopped fighting, and therefore the threat to the United States is now gone, what is it that we're doing? And of course, there are those like Woodrow Wilson who say, no, no, we need to keep the army in Europe. We need to maintain this presence. We need even to send troops into Siberia. We need to make sure that we're creating this new world order. Defeating the Germans is only one side of that. Right. There are people at the other end of the spectrum. Again, Theodore Roosevelt is one of the voices. And Henry Cabot Lodge, the senator from Massachusetts, is another who say, no, our job is essentially done. We don't want to go down this road of international institutions and League of Nations and 14 points and all of that. That's not what this war was for. So part of it comes, I think, from that divergence. Part of it also comes from all of the frustration with trying to get the Treaty of Versailles through the U.S. Senate, which of course never happened. The League of Nations, which is so offensive to the Harding administration that they return mail from the League of Nations back to the League unopened. All of the nasty political and social rhetoric that follows on around it. So Americans are agreed in April 1917 that they have to fight this war. They're not at all agreed on what the purpose and reasoning of the war was. And then I think by 1929, by the time of the Great Depression, it just looks like, hey, it was a good idea to do this, but every decision we've made since then seems to have been wrong. Yeah, that's kind of buyer's remorse or something, something along those lines. Well, what's important about this story for now? You know, history should be interesting and fascinating and compelling and inspiring and all of those things, but it should also in some ways speak to us today, tell us something, inform our own world in 2017. So what's the significance of the U.S. entry into World War I that you would argue might be important today? To me, I hear some of the rhetoric in the American political discourse that sounds very much like 1919, 1917 to me. So the debate in the United States right now over whether the United States is better served working through international institutions or whether it's better served operating on its own, that is operating with other countries only when it really suits America's interests. That's a 1919 debate. When Americans in 1919 talked about isolationism, they didn't mean ignoring Europe. What they meant was the best way to deal with Europe was to do it from a position of power. And the United States having that power should treat other countries as if they are you know, allies, but also that they are potential rivals. They are potential people that you're going to may have to disagree with. So that kind of debate, that kind of mentality that I hear in the American political rhetoric today strikes me as very similar to what we were dealing with 100 years ago, as does the question of why America engages in wars. Is it for the greater benefit of mankind and the, the greater benefit of the international system? Or do you do it for much more narrowly defined national interest? And that's very much a Woodrow Wilson, Theodore Roosevelt debate. So to me, when I hear American political discourse, especially about foreign policy, it strikes me as being quite similar and quite, quite fresh. And I ask my students to read Woodrow Wilson's Declaration of War speech, which he gave 100 years ago next week to the Senate. And it sounds to me very much like the way Americans think about the world today. Wilson says, we're not at war with the German people. We're at war with the German regime. We're doing this to create a world that's going to be more democratic, more interconnected, more capitalist with open markets. All of that sounds to me very much like American political rhetoric from both parties today. Yeah, it is striking, this idea of war somehow being a vehicle for spreading our ideals and our, our institutions and our principles worldwide. I think a lot of younger folks would think of that as a relatively recent phenomenon, but it has deep roots in our history. Right. It absolutely comes out of Wilson. It comes out of this kind of understanding. I think he probably did say it, but Wilson is attributed with the great saying about sending the army into Mexico, that I will teach these Mexicans to elect good men. Mm. You know, that kind of a mentality that you can force change, you can force cultural change and behavioral change out of states with the use of military force. And the first time we really experiment with that on a big scale is the years 1914 to 1918. Yeah. And with a little bit of a dress rehearsal in the Spanish-American War, but definitely World War I, because it is a global event, is, is really the first full attempted rollout of that idea, especially when you consider the, the post-war effort to create a, a new world order through the Treaty of Versailles and the uh, League of Nations and so forth. Fascinating stuff. And quite literally, to reorient Europe and, by extent, much of the rest of the world 
from those four great empires, the Ottoman, Russian, German, and Austro-Hungarian, and to reorient them into nation states in the way that Wilson and others wanted to do. It's not just Wilson. is a complete reorientation of the European political map in a way that nobody could have envisioned in 1914. And something that wouldn't be realized, uh, nearly realized or realized more so for many decades to come. Well, Michael Nyberg, this has been great. I really enjoyed your book. It's fascinating and very timely. And as you note, does have things to tell us about our, our situation today. So thank you very much for speaking to us at In the Pass Lane. Thank you very much. Michael Nyberg is a professor of history at the U.S. Army War College. I spoke with him today about his latest book, The Path to War, How the First World War Created Modern America, published by Oxford University Press. For more information about Michael Nyberg and his books, go to the show page for this episode at inthepastlane.com. All right, my friends, that's a wrap for this episode of In the Past Lane. If you want to learn more about the U.S. role in World War I, check out all the information we've posted on the show page for this episode at our website, inthepastlane.com. And if you enjoy learning about military history, you might also want to check out some of our past episodes, like number 20 on the Civil War and number 17 on the American Revolution. And remember, we have an upcoming episode on the Spanish-American War. In the Past Lane is an independently produced podcast, so we rely on loyal listeners like you to help spread the word. So please, subscribe to In the Past Lane at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you access your podcasts. And tell other people about In the Past Lane. One of the top ways that podcasts gain new listeners is by word of mouth. So if you know someone who's into history, tell them about In the Past Lane. Thanks. Many terrific people make In the Past Lane possible, including our new associate producer, Devin McHugh. We also want to thank the Free Music Archive for supplying the music for this episode. I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, what's on your mind? Where did you come from? SBI, Snoring Beagle International. (laughs) 